Um, first, I want to play this clip. It is the governor of Kentucky, Matt Bevins. He is on Trish Regan's show, Fox Fox News or Fox Business. I don't know. Which she was one filling is. in for Cavuto. She was filling in for Cavuto on Fox News or Fox Business or whatever it is. And this is in response to, I think it's longer than 26 seconds, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, 326. All right, that makes more sense. As you know, the administration, the Trump administration, released its guidance for Medicaid work requirements, or so-called community engagement. That's what it's called, community engagement. It's going to allow 10 states which are pursuing the policy of requiring their Medicaid recipients to work and this is an attempt by these states to justify culling their roles you should know that eight in ten medicaid beneficiaries of working age already live in a family where there is at least one worker okay The Kaiser Family Foundation has found that the most Medicaid beneficiaries who are not working are sick or disabled. However, they don't meet the incredibly tough, stringent standards of Social Security disability, where it's like almost like a two year waiting period to be considered disabled enough to get Social Security. Um. What this is going to do is it's going to lard up the Medicaid process for everybody. You're going to have to not just prove that you have a job now. You're going to have to consistently prove that you have a job. You're going to have to make sure that the government is recording this information correctly. You're going to have to continue, you know, so. Anything that you mail that gets lost, anything that you write in. Anything at work. I mean, look, this happens all the time. We have a small operation here, and there's always at least one screw up. But here is Matt Bevins trying to justify this, and we're going to pick apart some of the lies as we go. Hours ago, Kentucky becoming the first state to get approval to require Medicaid recipients to work. The state's Republican governor, Matt Bevin, joins me right now by phone. And Governor Bevin, uh, you're getting some criticism for this why do you think it's the right thing to do it's interesting criticism always comes from liberals they have no solutions they are writing failed policies but pause maybe- it for one second uh the solution is medicaid at the very least you are sitting uh in a state that has one of the most popular obamacare programs in the country because they have no solutions. They are writing failed policies, but anybody who would propose an alternative uh, is quick to receive their scorn. I believe it's the right thing to do because I grew up in poverty. I grew up with no access to health care coverage for the first 20-something years of my life. I was an active duty Army officer before I ever had access. And I understand that as uh, administ- In other words, um, I wasn't, I didn't have access to government health care, so I want to screw other people. And then I went and I got government uh, health care. And uh, that was fine. Trader Verma put it the other day, it is absolutely soft bigotry. Low expectations is not what people in America need. The dignity that people get and receive from the opportunity to do for themselves, to be engaged in their own health outcome, is what ultimately leads to better health outcomes. When people pause have it, a vet- pause it. So he is you, Matt Bevins here is suggesting that maybe we would all feel better about ourselves if we had all be just become our own doctors as well. You know, this is the equivalent of the Paul Ryan kids feel better if they have their own lunch packed story yes except for we're also now talking about health now we're talking about health like i mean let's be honest folks you can go in you can have your surgeon take out your tonsils or do that uh remove your appendix but aren't you gonna feel just a little bit better about yourself if you do it yourself 
engaged in uh, your own healthcare outcome is a really good euphemism for run the risk of being bankrupt medically. Yeah, exactly. Continue. Or buy Alex Jones products. Did interest in anything. They are more likely to care about it, to utilize it, and to get the maximum value from it. I am utterly convinced from personal experience that having that opportunity is the greatness of America, and we owe it to people to give them that chance to improve their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, part of the problem with welfare is that it becomes a bit of a trap. And, uh, you know, it, it, you can't go to work because you're getting that much from the government. And uh, then you just want more from the government. It's that much harder to go to work. You think about, say, a single mom who makes a rational decision, perhaps, to stay home because she may have more money coming into her via the state, via the federal government, than if she were to actually go to work and have to pay for daycare and have to pay for gas, et cetera, et cetera, and be away from her kids. So it seems to me that there should be some kind of in-between system, Governor, where we're doing what we can to help people to help themselves. And is this one way? Pause it, pause it. Now, now listen, <clears throat> I don't know where Trish Regan comes from, but it must be a land where people aren't very bright. Uh, yeah, she works at Fox News. Well, I guess she works at Fox News. First off, Medicaid is not a cash payment. Medicaid provides you with health care. So there's no scenario where you're like, hey, man, I'm getting free health care, so I'm just going to go and spend it all at the supermarket. Or, hey, man, <laughs> I'm getting free health care. That means... Or, yeah. or Bahamas, here I come. I didn't even need that treatment, but I just got it because <laughs> it was free. Uh, I wanted my tonsils removed. Why? Free ice cream, dude. Dude, I'm getting, I'm it's, getting it's, that cancer treatment. It's, so it's, you know what that means? New car. Hey, why are you getting like, chemo, brah? Because it's free. You don't even I, need to have cancer. They'll do it. Hey, hey, hey. I'm getting. Uh, they're they're checking my. my they're, they're checking me for colon cancer. Don't need to go to work now. <laughs> you know, like, what is, like, this is, this doesn't even, as much as their little, as their welfare, their their fantasy, that there's some type of, like, huge checks being cut to people. And then this idea that, like, look, and then, so, so that's the sort of, like, the biggest level of stupidity that one could express in this argument that she just expressed. But the second one where she's saying, like, isn't there something in between where you don't make that calculation that it's actually cheaper to stay at home or make, you make more money by staying home than versus work? In any system where you're going to have a cutoff for eligibility, you're going to run into this problem. It is completely unavoidable. Even if you were to allow, let's say, let's we're going to do a 10 percent bump on either side and start to um, start to diminish it as you go. You're going to run into that problem at any point where you have a cutoff. The only the only thing that you're talking about is maybe something like maybe a um, universal basic income, which doesn't take into account any type of cutoff. That could help you. Or how about this? How about. Free daycare. How about government-sponsored free daycare? And government-sponsored health care? And government-sponsored guarantee of housing? And then, then there wouldn't be this calculation. People could just go to work if that's what's so important, Trish. Continue. And is this one way, via this Medicaid reform, a way of doing that? Absolutely, Trish. And I'll tell you, it's interesting. This is the first federal entitlement reform that we've seen since the mid-90s. This is, this is going to be transformative, not just for Kentucky, but as a model for the nation, because it will give millions of people who are in that trap that you've just described the opportunity to get out. Medicaid and other entitlement programs were not intended to be life destinations. They were not intended to be dead ends. They were intended to be transitory situations for certainly able-bodied people, people with alternatives. We want to provide those alternatives to them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in this waiver is exactly that, the ability to come alongside existing uh, requirements and transition people to the private sector, mm -hmm. transition them to traditional and commercial health 
care provided by employers because they're out there working. And if for some reason that employer program is not the same that they would have gotten under Medicaid, that we'll come alongside and make up the difference costing the taxpayer right. less. And, and, and I just want to point out, uh, you know, for your sake, that if, for example, you had a single mother that couldn't work, you're not going to force her to work and, you know, perhaps take the kids in tow to that. And somebody who was very, very ill and couldn't work, uh, that person as well would not be forced. You're talking about able-bodied people that have time on their hands that could do it. Yeah, except for they don't have a job, per se. I mean, in a way, the Chiron is right when it says uh, this is a result of liberal policies that are bad, uh, not in the way that this guy means it, but um, the idea of means testing uh, entitlement programs instead of having broad social programs. Um, liberals have been doing it for years under the banner of saving money. And what that does is it um, makes these programs much more vulnerable to attack. Yep. Um, because not as many people care about them when they don't apply to as many people. Um, it divides up the working class because the, the threshold is always too low. Always. So there's always going to be people who are directly above it, who resent the ones below it. Um, that's what we saw that with Obamacare to a certain extent. You go up to 133% of poverty under Obamacare to the extent that the states uh, took that. And there's a lot of people who are at like 135% of poverty who are like, I've got to go in the exchanges now. Yeah. And you've got people like Hillary Clinton out there saying that single payer will never, ever come to pass and mocking the idea that um, there could be any kind of broad-based social program that millionaires' kids are going to take advantage of. That's not all right. And then uh, it's not that far-fetched to say you can draw a line from those kinds of policies to the Republican attack on Medicaid right now. Uh, I just would really like to see everybody in that clip be homeless. That's like my new like as don't, long don't, as but you know what you're just like you don't have, that's the thing is you don't have the empathy to understand that's true what happens when you're trapped by getting health insurance that's a great point no I I actually do have you're stuck in empathy. that trap. I had this I had this I'm I'm realizing through watching all these clips that I had this unbelievably luxurious childhood because <laughs> my family had things like housing subsidy you don't understand subsidized, you were trapped like heat. you were in you were in uh, no it was really liberatory it was in, like the heat and electricity were turned off. Mm. I felt a lot greater sense of responsibility as a 10 year old. <laughs> um, like I said, uh, here's more specific uh, data on uh, just who is working. You have 25 million non um, Social Security disabled adults between 19 and 64 who are uh, enrolled in Medicaid in 2016. 25 million Americans, six in 10 are working themselves. Eight in 10, so two more per family, are in families with at least one worker. Two-thirds with a full-time worker and another 14% with a part-time worker. So you're talking about two in 10 who are in a family with no worker. And of those, the majority of those two in 10 are either uh, disabled enough or sick enough that they can't work, but not disabled enough to be on SSI. And then it's quite possible that one in 10 who are on Medicaid, they can't find work. But let's say, let's say that one in 10 are just living large. I get to be on Medicaid and I don't have to work. I get to be on Medicaid and I can sit here and do nothing because I got no money. And I can just lounge around here and just wait till I get sick and then I can go get health care. If I can get down to the hospital that covers my Medicaid. Because I don't have any money to even take the public transportation to get there. Like the 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 dream in these people's heads, as opposed to what they're really doing, which is. Larding up the system, making it harder for people to access it. Period. End of story. And they don't want to do this. They don't want to do this in a frontal way. Because when they cut Medicaid, they know there is some pushback. Also, I have plenty of solutions. I resent that. Like put uh, the governor in a gulag as an example. 
rip that woman out of her apartment, reexpropriate it for the common good, and put her in a gulag as well. I have a lot of policy innovation ideas here, okay? They're going to have yeah. to also work in the gulag so oh, yeah. that they have a sense of pride about no, it. No, I don't want them to be trapped in a system where they're just in a gulag all day and not <laughs> God tapping. forbid. Yeah, I don't want them to feel disempowered. I uh, will be a little skippy on the healthcare, though. Do we? Hi, folks. Sam Cedar here. We still need your help on our Patreon page. YouTube ads have come back, but not nearly as much as we had before. So if you can help us out, any little bit helps. Head over to our Patreon page right at this URL, and you'll help us keep helping you by making videos.